Now, in recent weeks on the show, we've looked at the rise of cocaine use. What casual users can often fail to realise is that the Saturday night hobby is actually fuelled by criminal gangs. In Ireland, these gangs often recruit young, with children as young as eight being used as drug mules, runners or lookouts. In the town of town of Drogheda in County Louth, an implementation board was set up in the wake of gangland violence and among the measures taken there were programmes to support children at risk of dropping out of school. And now the Minister for Justice, Helen McEntee, has announced the establishment of a similar board in Ballymun and of course there have been interventions in Darndale and Cherry Orchard as well. So, we are joined uh, in studio by criminologist uh, Trina O'Connor, uh, former Governor of Mountjoy Prison, John Lonergan, and on the line by uh, Nicola Talent, Investigations Editor for The Sunday World. Uh, we'll go to Nicola first. Nicola, good morning. Good morning, Pat. I was trying to get a, a, an idea of uh, just how extensive uh, is the use of young people, I mean, very young children, by the criminal gangs. Yeah, it's hugely extensive. I mean, across Europe, not just here in Ireland, they're actually calling us now instead of grooming, uh, Europe are now calling it radicalisation of children, which is really probably more suitable a word because they are being brought into drug gangs. Some of them, I mean, whatever age they are, they're they're feeling they're willingly joining. They want to be part of something. They're being lured by the money, the runners, you know, the usual trappings of, of wealth. And they're seeing um, entry into a drug gang as a career path. And unfortunately, that is the fact for a lot of kids living largely in marginalised areas. You don't no. usually see it happening in, in more privileged areas. Yeah, And we know that uh, children often don't look at the negatives of any of these things. I mean, how many of the people they admire today will actually end up at the mortuary slab? That's the truth of it. Yeah, those that stay in it. I mean, a lot of them will kind of, you know, trick around a little bit and come up, come back out of it. There is a finite number of them that will go on to become proper career criminals and, and become significant players in, in organised crime. But the, the idea is, I suppose, to try and steer them away from that in the first place, because even those that don't become major players in, in gang crime, they can end up entering the, the criminal justice system. And if they've gone to jail or to, you know, to... to um, they have been, you know, convicted or something that will stay with them for life. Sure. So they're sort of marked and branded with that uh, unnecessarily. It's a complex issue, like, because there are some people uh, who will be brought into drug gangs by their family. It's, it, you know, it can be a family business uh, and that career path is almost laid out for them as soon as they're born. There's others that are drawn in and very quickly they, they'll be leaned on as becoming almost a breadwinner for a family. And you'll see parents and grandparents and others kind of feeding off what they're earning. Then you have others who will be drawn in, who the families will be absolutely abhorred by it. And they probably are the ones that have the better chance of being brought back mm. out by interventions. How often might it be the case that the family wouldn't be aware of what their young fellow was doing until perhaps he comes home wearing a pair of trainers that he cannot possibly afford? It's often the way and actually, um, you know, there was a, a young guy called Jordan Davis who was murdered. He was pushing his baby in a, in a pram when he was killed. And his mother in her victim impact statement in the court, Sandra Davis, said that she began to notice that she'd be picking up his clothes from the bedroom floor and there was wads of cash in them. And, you know, when she questioned him, he said he was just doing a bit of cannabis stealing, but she knew it was cocaine that had, you know, was the, the big thing and also he had bought you know when when his girlfriend became pregnant she said she hoped that he would take a different path but then when she saw the pram was 1500 quid she realized he was still in it so that's kind of a little small story that came out of a tragedy really mm. um from her victim impact statement but it just shows that often until the money starts appearing or those runners or whatever, people don't know that they've got, got involved. Now, how they use them, I mentioned the idea of, of drugs mules, in other words, transporting the stuff from A to B on the basis that they're unlikely to be stopped and searched <coughs> by a, a local Garda. But how else do they use them? Do they actually use them to sell? Oh, actually, there used to be a career path that went into before you kind of came up into sort of drug gangs, a lot of young kids used to sort of joyride and do petty thefts and stuff like that. That's all gone. They're straight in now and they're being used, largely the younger kids are being used to 
intimidate people to pay up drug debt. So they're throwing pipe bombs through people's windows. You know, they're they're threatening people. They're they were kind of more much higher end crimes, and that's entry level now. So um, things have changed. Really, cocaine has changed everything because the amount of money that there is to be made from it. So there isn't even that kind of maybe we'd call it gentler career path into it. Now they're just straight in. Are they likely to be users themselves? Well, if they're not, they probably start using, you know, because there's drugs around them. And sometimes kids were sent out to sell. Um, I think you spoke, Pat, to Joey O'Callaghan before, and he did, uh, he was subject to the book, The Witness and, and the podcast, but he spoke about being sent into Ballymun Towers as a young child to sell drugs as 12, 13. And he was actually given cocaine to give him the courage because he was scared. So, you know, a lot of them will take, the drugs or would be given the drugs for that very reason it'll you know it'll make them more sometimes aggressive it'll give them a little bit of courage to go and lob a pipe bomb through somebody's house now one of the topics that came up during our uh, focus on cocaine was that uh, some of the turf wars have actually died down because there's so much cocaine there there's profit for everybody is that the case well i mean look that's was seen as being the case in Limerick, but those gangs just sort of matured in a way and probably got sick of killing one another because that went on for a long time in Limerick and a lot of people lost their lives. These feuds are usually fight to the death and there isn't a maturity there that, you know, we'll all stand back and let one another operate. They don't really operate like that. When they're business-like structures, gangs, they are fueled by greed and ambition. Um, so they don't usually sort of stand back and let other people, you know, play on their territory or anything like that. Um, so I don't think that's, it's, it certainly is not my experience, the situation. All right, Nicola, look, thank you for uh, your insights into uh, what is actually happening on our streets and listening to that Trino O'Connor criminologist and John Lonergan, former governor of Mountjoy Prison. Um, John, first of all, I remember when you and I talked many years ago about uh the prison population and you were saying the greatest predictor of who's going to end up in your care in Mount Joy was their address. Yeah, yeah, and that was... um, Now, I suppose the first thing I want to say, Pat, is after 30, 35 years, I would have to, you know, say that on the positive side that many, many wonderful initiatives have taken place and a huge number of young people um, today are, 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 as a result of the initiatives and the interventions, are now leading what we class, classify normal uh, uh, lives. For instance, youth reach, uh, you know, has, has a major intervention for children that just couldn't find their way in second level education. Uh, the Children Act of 2001, what people don't realise, I suppose, is we have the lowest number of young people under 18 ever in the history of the state in detention at the moment. That's less than 50. I mean, everyone remembers St. Patrick's Now, don't forget there'll be people uh, saying, yeah, but what about these gangs of young fellas who surround people, who terrorise people, and then um, they just get into a, a, a diversion yeah. programme rather than being, as some people would like to see, see them punished. No, but, but I, I, just, I just think, I, I'll come to that as well because I have st- sort of strong views on that as well. But in relation to a whole lot of interventions that have taken place over the years, they have made a difference. And the numbers of, of children that have been discussed there... So there are a number are, of adults who are living productive lives well, who would not have 80, done so. For instance, the DISH school initiative. But 82% now of children that go to DISH schools complete second level education. That is an amazing achievement. Because, uh, fine, the, neg- the negative people will say, but 18% are not. But 82% of people who are in the DISH school, for instance, the Mehel system under the Tusla has been a wonderful intervention as well and has, has certainly... So the point I suppose I'm making is that there's a hell of a lot of, ch- of change has taken place and I believe the numbers who are at risk have reduced. But you still have a significant number of young, mainly males... I mean, I want to emphasize that as well. It's mainly, and, and, and it was mentioned there already, the two things that really influence are the culture that they grow up in and is created by those people. There's no positive male role model in their life. They're all negative as far as we'd be concerned. But of course, they see them as very positive. And the other, other thing is immaturity. And that was mentioned already in the interview. Immaturity. They're just too immature. And, I, and anyone can, and I suppose outside can understand that. They are also, very, which, which is part of the thing that a lot of people around drugs don't understand and don't appreciate. They, uh, they, are, they really want, they, they love risk. 
and being on the edge. So doing things that you and me would say, oh my God, how could you do that? They do that to get that kick out of it. So the risk thing, the risk that's involved, like, you know, involved in, in blackmailing people and bullying people and all that, that's, there's a sense of buzz in that. There's a sense of power as well, Pat. Yeah. Uh, you know, part of the gangland few thing is, is more about control in the things of, look at me, I'm the more powerful person rather than just the money involved. So that's another human. But it is an immaturity as well. So while a lot of things has, has, has happened, uh, those young children that are being brought into crime, there's no question about it at all. But that, that you know, they are going to end up uh, with, with serious criminal convictions. They're going to end up seriously addicted to drugs and many of them will have a very short lifespan. All right. Now, uh, Trina, I want to talk to you about, uh, you know, these intervention programs that have been introduced. There was uh, one in Drogheda that we referred to on foot of uh, gangland killings there. Um, Cherry Orchard has had its intervention, Darndale, and now we have one uh, announced for Ballymun. Uh, what exactly do they mean? So I suppose what they mean uh, when an implementation board is set up, it comes out of research. And what happens then is we develop programmes that have wraparound services that look at all of the individual social care needs of these areas and in particular the young people that we're targeting in this way. So you'd be looking at psychological support, you'd be looking at sporting facilities, you'd be looking at uh, support support for the family to help the family if like bail supervision for example um, you'd be looking at more ho- better housing better uh, schools completions. So all of the different things that can but go that's wrong. that's huge. It is huge and it's a huge body of work and it also is very resource heavy because sometimes some of these families might have 10 or 12 different agencies working with them. And uh, yeah, absolutely. And that's what's needed because if we really want to truly remove people from criminality and support young people away from criminality, we have to support the whole family. Because as Nicola said, and as John has mentioned, we know what the predictors are for young people to get involved in criminality. And one of them predictors are being part of a family where there's intergenerational criminality or where there's an acceptance of crime at whatever level. So it may be an acceptance of shoplifting, for example, in teenagers, but that can very quickly escalate in today's climate because that young person there is then vulnerable for grooming or radicalisation. Um, and we do see this. We see young people being trafficked into gangs all, all across now, the world. This kind of intervention seems like fantastic yeah. that it would address every single <clears throat> deficit in uh, those kids' lives. But uh, does it happen? I mean, in those uh, places I've mentioned where implementation boards have been set up in uh, Cherry Orchard, in Darndale, in Drogheda, I mean, have we seen results? Well, you know, it depends who you're talking to, Pat, really, whether we've seen results. But what I will tell you is we have seen these kind of um implementation boards and wraparound services work in other countries when the funding is guaranteed over over at least a decade because it takes about a decade to change a generation. So, so this uh, stop-go funding, that it, does no, not it doesn't work. work. And, and the problem with it is there's, there's loads of reasons why it doesn't work. But one, for example, is if you only give a 12-month funding to an initiative that's making a difference and improving the lives within a community, how are you going to employ the right people and get them to stay? Somebody who's a professional is not going to go and work somewhere if they only have a 12-month contract. So it's very important that we get the right people there. Also, to get buy-in from a community, that can be difficult enough. And if you continually put funding in and then pull funding out, when something is is working well, that can then cause a lot of harm between the, I suppose, the confidence between the community and whatever department they're working so, in. So uh, what happens is that the budget has to be agreed every year, very much like uh, any other departmental budget, whether it's the HSE or whatever, this programme, that programme, they get reviewed every year. Is that it? it? So, some do, but I think the, the government have listened to some community organisations and they have agreed to support multi-annual funding, but still not a decade long because you know the way our politics work. Every four to five years we get new government, so things get lost. That's the problem. We really do need the government, whatever government is in next, whatever government is in after that, to guarantee that funding is over that decade. It's, it's very interesting. I was talking to a man this morning who was on Off the Ball and he's involved in, in uh, training young people for yeah. sport and he said there's a, a six week programme uh, for loads of kids in a particular area I won't uh, specify because we may well go up and have a look at it um, and crime dropped by 50% yeah. during the period of 
the activity when all the kids were involved yeah. in this sporting activity. Yeah. It just dropped. And Pat, there is the Icelandic model that has been proved and I've spoken about it before. And under the Icelandic model over a, over a decade, they brought down antisocial behaviour from something in the 80, 80% down to around 17% by investing in sport and by investing in cards. So every child could do whatever sport they wanted to do without any cost to the family. The family signed up to a charter for curfews for young people. It's, there's a lot of detail in it, but it's really, really good But model. you're talking about buy-in from families and yeah. there are dysfunctional families who and would not buy in. And that's why we need them wraparound supports to support families because whenever you're looking at the kind of criminality that we're talking about here, we're looking at young people without critical thinking, with split thinking, with, you know, psychological wounds that really need to be addressed and our social services are letting them down from mm. a mental health perspective. Yeah, uh, We did a report yesterday from Dublin 8, the, their quest for a playing pitch. There, there yeah. isn't one uh, available to them. And the, the, the mantra that I would take from it is it's better to be in a team than in a gang. It is, Pat, but I, there, there's still one major issue and that's engagement. And you can have all the facilities and, and resources in the world, including sport, but there will still, and there are, a, a, a core group, a small but significant group of kids that are connected to nothing, won't engage in anything. And, I, and they're the ones that really need, and this is why I'm, I'm a bit excited about the initiative in Drada, to see how it works. And that is that people are going out there specifically to try to engage with that particular individual on an individual basis. Because we, when you have no engagement and no connection, well, then uh, it's, it's irrelevant what resources are there uh, so we do need that connection thing I, and coming back though to what you said as well I think you have to stop at some stage as well and say listen there are some responsibilities with the individuals themselves and there are some responsibilities with the families even though they may need a lot of support but like for a child to be out at 9 and 10 and 11 at night time coming home with money or, or anything and, and nothing happening in relation to consequences one of the things Pat that I've learned in Mount Joy was that young men in particular have no concept of consequences they have to learn the hard way and sometimes that means that they need to be brought mm. to justice really yeah. and held responsible for their behaviour because if they don't connect to anything then they're, they're going the other direction Yeah but without the role models that Trina adverted to it must be very difficult if the only thing you see is dysfunction where do you learn? Absolutely. And in fairness to families, many families are struggling themselves. A lot of them are single parent families. A lot of them have the parents themselves or the parent himself or herself have serious difficulties around addiction, mental health issues. You name it. They have the, those problems as well. So the child is often, uh, you know, uh, neglected in a sense that they don't have that sort of support and the role model and the control. Because fundamentally, discipline is a, is a vital part of living a normal life. You have to have discipline. And when, when that's apt, when, you know, I found that for, for just quickly when in 1977-78 when Lachan House opened mm -hmm. as a replacement for the old uh, Marlborough House. Uh, the, 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 there was only about 27 kids from the inner city of Dublin. They weren't bad children. They were wild children. They had no boundaries. They had no structure. When they got structure, prison, by the way, often does that for people as well. It gives them a structure. There's a time to go to bed. There's a time to get up. They get food. So, so, the, yeah. Some of the most and basic I, I've been things. I've been both to Mount Joy and I've been to Oberstown and I've seen the way it works and I mean, there could be a teacher in a class with maybe one kid or mm. two kids or mm. at most maybe half a dozen mm. kids. Uh, when they get that kind of close up attention, Trina, how do they emerge? Well, actually, I've I've talked to young people who have been in situations like this. And very often, and one really sticks out in my mind, one young lad said to me, the safest I ever felt was when I was in. Overstown and the most cared for I ever felt was when I was in Overstown and that's a really damning indictment of some of the situations that we're seeing young people living in so I think to go back to um, John's point around you know the social economic status and the dysfunctionality and all of them predictors I think there is also another piece that we're missing here and that is the clean young people that are being groomed into these gangs so these are young people who come from a background where their parents may be time poor because they're both working sure. and they're trying to keep the family going. Um, and they, with, with, you know, the pressures of society now, they, they may have other children that they're focusing on and they think they've read that child and that child is OK. And them young people are often used as money mills and their bank accounts are often used. And that can lock young people out of, you know, financial services for life and give them, I think, up to 14 years they can get for money milling. 
Um, so, so there's a lot of indig- uh, insidious ways these gangs can get into our communities yeah. and it's not just what we expect it to be. Yeah. I'll read you some of the text coming in. Uh, drug treatment centres should be moved to the suburbs and let the weekend drug users see the consequences of their coke use. That's from Chris uh, on WhatsApp. Kids from disadvantaged areas in drugs gangs are supplying drugs to the people from well-to-do areas. So those people should realise what they are feeding. Um, John Lonergan is wrong, says a texter. There's zero Garda presence. So vast amounts of crime committed by under-18s not being detected at all. That's from Fred. Well, that's a separate issue now. I mean, around detection of crime. Uh, the, the, what I'm going by... I, but you I, know, I, if, if I, kids are wild and there's no Garda to tell them, you know, absolutely. shape up. Yeah. If there's no guard on the street. Absolutely. But what, what, what it's a different issue in relation to gangland feuds and all that. I, I actually agree with that person. If, if what, the, the big question is, how are these ganglands, our gang lords, allowed to uh, operate? How are they free to bring in children? How are they free to sell drugs on the street by, and using people mm-hmm. to do that? I mean, that's a law and order issue and that's an issue that yeah. needs to be addressed now, here, separately. Here's an interesting comment and it's a difficult one. A lot of what you're talking about is child abuse. Where is Thusla in all of this? Why are these neglected children left in these families? Now, the Constitution safeguards the family and so on. The idea of, uh, you know, zooming in and saying this kid is learning the drugs trade from his father or grandfather or whatever. Yeah. Um, But you can't see the Thusla just whipping that kid out. No, no. But but what we do need is we do need a a child criminal exploitation unit. And that needs to be made up of Angarda Shikana, social workers, psychologists and all of the the different areas that we need. And we also need a child sexual exploitation unit because very often, and this is the piece that gets missed in this conversation when we talk about drugs, sexual exploitation is there as well within them gangs. So where, where there's drugs, there's violence and there's also sexual exploitation. And both of them things are missing within um, from a national strategy. And when you look across the water to the UK, they have both of these units set up and they work very effectively. Um, more of the comments coming in. I'm working in a DESH school. Great interventions given to DESH to educate these vulnerable children about life skills, right and wrong and so on. But we're currently short 12 teachers. Yes, 12 teachers. These children can't access these supports given to DESH as we don't have the staff to do it, to bring these children out in small groups and work with them maybe one to one. This is someone working in a primary school in West Dublin. Uh, Coming from Darndale, still living there, unfortunately, it will never change, even with all these programmes. Massive poverty, addictions, third level education is only a dream. And over the years, the demographics have changed. Where it used to be married parents being housed, it's now more likely drug addicts being housed. Keep putting the same type of person in the area and the same outcome will always happen. That's from Paul in Dublin. Isn't that true that uh, policies by local authorities have often... They've looked at all the dysfunctional people they have and they say rather than have each one be toxic within a greater group, move them all to the same so they can be toxic yeah. with each other. Our, I've said it a hundred times over the last 30 years, our housing policy has been an absolute disaster. And all the years that have been made to Cherry Orchard, Darndale, parts of Drogheda, they're all exactly, they have the same problem. It's about housing, alienation of people, creating uh, ghettos really, um, because that's what they are, and, and then looking for miracles that young people can grow up and achieve uh, their full uh, potential in such environments. It's impossible. Trina? Yeah, and the research has shown that if you put somebody in an environment like that, well, then they they grow up with what we call like a deficit in social capital, even before they move out there. Now, there are a lot of programmes like, for example, Preparing for Life on the north side of Dublin, and they work with young people. Uh, they work with mothers from um, Before pregnancy. Before they've had the baby. Yeah, from pregnancy onwards, and they offer support. But we could argue that we're putting up barriers. It's not about equality here. It's actually about equity. And very often you hear people giving out about the amount of resources that are put into these communities. But all of the environmental factors that are there are already already barriers for young people growing up. So they have to overcome so much, even if they go to university, for example. They may not have the money for lunch or they may not have the money for transport, even though they might get some... Um, grants and that it's still not enough because they're coming from a, a, uh, a and deficit. also you go into a situation as a university student and you see all the haves yeah. and the posh boys yeah. and the posh yeah. girls and so yeah. on and yeah. uh, 
You may f- be made to feel inadequate. It might not be the intention of the other students, but yeah. it's the effect. Yeah, well, that was my experience when I first went to university back 30 odd years ago. They just called me Northside, like, you know, and like, look, it didn't bother me. I'm a big girl, but there was other people that that would have been harmful to, you know. Sure. So, yeah. And, and who may well have dropped out. Uh, final one from Dave and Galway. Sick and tired of people making excuses for thugs and violent antisocial behaviour. We need to get much more serious and tough with these offenders. Simple as that. Why do we continue to allow a few to ruin things for the majority? That's probably a common enough thought, I would say. Yeah, and John. It, there, he has some, he has, yeah, there's some justification in it. Uh, we, we, sh- we shouldn't forget either, it's very important that as well, there are thousands of young people that grew up in those circumstances and have survived and came out of the other end uh, and never committed a crime or never involved in criminality. So you ha- And uh, there are some amazing people working at the coalface, teachers, uh, you know, and youth workers, coaches, there's uh, so many wonderful people uh, who are swimming against the tide day in, day out, but making a difference. And I, I think they need to be mentioned in a positive way. Trina, final yeah, words. And if I can just say to that, childhood shouldn't be about survival. Childhood should be about thriving. And unfortunately, because of some of the decisions that have been made by successive governments in, the, in this country, many children are in survival mode. And that in itself is a nervous uh, issue yeah. that we have for young people growing up for their nervous systems. Thank you both very much for joining us. Uh, Trina O'Connor, criminologist, and John Lonergan, former governor of Mountjoy Prison.